Um, so welcome, uh, welcome to everyone um, who are joining just now. Hopefully um, you're able to hear our voices. If not, there's a call in number that's posted there. You can call in um, through the chat. Uh, is the recording going? Okay, just making sure. Okay, is that a, had a moment. So there are 4.9, an estimated 4.9 million young adults ages 16 to 24 in America who are neither in work nor in school. Of these, there are estimated to be as many as 3 million youth living in poverty who are not in education, employment, or training. When I saw those numbers, my jaw dropped. Uh, so I don't know if any of you, we can't see your faces if your jaws are dropping, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are the opportunity youth with whom youth build programs around the country work. Um, there is also an international component, but um, specifically we're focusing and, and have folks today from Youth Build USA. So welcome to today to CAST's uh, free webinar. It's January 9th, 2018, this is just awesome. Um, I'm Allison Posey, I'm here in the CAST office, which is in Wakefield, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. And I'm really excited to be with you all today as we talk with youth build leaders from the field, Jason, Jason Marshall, Michael Anderson, and Issa Galvez, Galvez Lara. Uh, we hope that this conversation leaves you inspired to become part of this movement. And this is a movement that's really exciting because we're looking to build a more just society where there are sufficient opportunities for all, all people in all communities to fulfill their potential and to contribute to the well-being of others. And I love this because we're not <coughs> talking about your own potential, but we're talking about contributing to the well-being of others. It just gives me goose, goosebumps to think about this message. But before we begin, there are always a few just you know, a little logistics that we need to take care of here. Um, so we do hope that you contribute to the conversation today. Uh, you're welcome to use the text chat box as many of you already have started doing. And uh, just remember that in the left hand, or it, in, um, in, your, in your window, you'll see an area for the chat. And we ask that you make sure that you're responding to all panelists and attendees so everyone can hear your words. Um, However, if you have a comment that you think is pertinent only for the panelists or something that you think might distract other participants from the conversation, we do ask that you actually make that comment only to the panelists, just to make sure that we are able to, to respect um, the, the, the thread of conversation that most folks are, are um, engaging. But we do want to hear all of your thoughts, all of your concerns, um, all of your questions. Um, and we do have a live captioner here today. Thank you, Donna, for being here. If you would like to have captions on, um, just click on the little caption option that uh, should be located at the bottom of your screen. If you have any challenges um, getting those captions, feel free to let us know. Uh, again, by typing in, in the text box, that's the easiest way to get to us. And you can also uh, participate via Twitter. So this is for those of you joining live today, but there are also many folks who are watching remotely. You're probably in PJs, maybe it's 2 a.m. And so welcome to those of you who are joining um, at, um, on the recording. Uh, as we hope that this is just the beginning of the conversation, please always feel free to use any of the hashtags, the hashtag CastPL and the hashtag YouthBuildUSA um, so that we're able to keep the conversation conversation going not only today, um, but beyond um, the scope of just this webinar. So to practice um, using the chat box or Twitter, um, the goals for today, uh, we just want to take a moment always to, in a very UDL way, to take a moment and reflect on our goals. Um, we're going to learn about youth build, and we're going to share strategies to empower all learners from all communities to fulfill their potential and contribute to the well-being of others. So this is for all educators as well. Um, and so I invite you to take a moment and reflect on goals you may have. You've taken time out of your day today. We're grateful that you're here, part of this conversation. What are some goals that you have? What's something that you hope to learn? And if we don't get to your question or your focus during the scope of this conversation, again, we'll really look to follow up with you either through Twitter or some other social media. So we'll give you a moment to, um, to reflect, think about some expectations, uh, some goals that you may have for the conversation. And then we'll get to the good stuff. We'll introduce our guests for today um, and jump into the conversation. All right, well then without any 
further ado, uh, welcome Youth Build. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and we've included an image of some of the Youth Build fellows and you can see the video live with three of those fellows. And we challenge you all to try to find them in the pictures. So we have Jason Marshall, who is also up here in um, the Boston Youth Corps, uh, Boston area at the Youth Build headquarters. Um, so thank you for joining today, Jason. Do you want to, um, well, let's see if we can find Jason in the picture. <laughs> yeah, I kind of I stand out to say the least. So. <laughs> Um, so Jason, um, can you just, you know, say hello and tell us a little bit about what brought you to Youth Build and, and what you do there. And, um, and then I'm going to invite you to um, introduce um, Mike and Issa as well. All right. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, representing domestically and internationally. Um, my name is Jason Marshall. I'm the Director of Education at Youth Build USA, the headquarters in uh, right outside of Boston in Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, thank you, Allison, and the folks from CAST for having uh, myself and my, my colleagues, Isabel and Mike. Um, so I, uh, as I mentioned, I'm the Director of Education for Youth Build USA. Uh, we have about over 200 uh, different Youth Build affiliates domestically, and we're also in 21 countries uh, internationally, except for Chile and Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Um, essentially, we've been around for about 40 years now. Um, the, the organization was started by Dorothy Stoneman, which is our um, CEO. She uh, retired a year ago, and our current CEO is a gentleman named John Belverde. Um, our work is to work with out-of-school youth, opportunity youth, ages 16 to 24, as Allison mentioned, who are traditionally marginalized populations. Um, uh, the majority of our young people are, are Black and or Latino. Um, in rural and or urban areas all across the country. And essentially a youth build program is providing a few main things. One, it's providing um, young people an alternative space in education to get either their high school diploma or their um, high school diploma or a GED. Um, they're also gonna learn a vo uh, some type of vocational, get vocational training and, and learn the skills to have a trade that will provide them with some type of uh, uh, way to earn a significant income. Um, also, we do graduate leadership uh, training for our young people so that we can help them to have a critical analysis to go back and be able to impact their communities in a lot of, a lot of different ways. Some of them may become leaders um, and some of them may be able to contribute in ways where they're not necessarily out front being leaders, but they'll be able to have the skills, the analysis to impact their community. So uh, domestically, the 200 plus youth programs all have those three core pieces. Um, as an education director, I do a lot of technical assistance training for the education uh, staff and the youth schools across the country. That could look like professional development opportunities, um, teacher training opportunities, organizing conferences, and the like. And, and in terms of the teacher training piece, that's how I've been connected to my colleagues, Isabel and Mike. Um, one of the important initiatives that we run is uh, our uh, teacher training program, which is called the Youth Build Teacher Fellows, where we have every year we have between 10 to 12 uh, youth build educators who apply into this uh, program and we choose of those that apply we choose 10 um, 10 to 12 and it's a year-long intensive teacher training opportunity where we you know they get uh, grounded in the concepts of learning differences and another concept of universal design for learning which I'm not sure if everybody on this call has heard about it but I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit more um, and so I'll just use that as kind of like a Andre to introduce uh, my colleagues, Michael Anderson and Isabel. They'll talk about themselves a little bit. They're actually former teaching fellows who uh, I worked with two years ago. Um, and last year, they were also um, worked as universal design for learning coaches where they worked with um, uh, respective youth build programs around the country, teaching their uh, education staff about the concepts of UDL and how it could impact the classroom um, learning environment. So I'll, uh, allow them, if Allison, if that's okay, I allow them to just introduce It's perfect, and we're gonna keep looking for both of you in there. And I just, as a quick aside, you know, as you're talking about the mission of Youth Build, I just, I'd love to think of that as the mission of all educators and our entire system. Um, unfortunately, it's not always, but what an, I mean, it, it really is a standout. So, okay, yes, go for it. <laughs> I guess I can go first. Hi, everyone. 
My name is Isabel Galvez Lara. I work with Youth Build Charter School of California and we work across Southern California. So um, I actually work for an educational entity. Um, youth Build has five pillars and one of those pillars is education and each Youth Build program determines how they choose to fulfill that need for education. And at our school, we provide an interdisciplinary approach to learning that only services Youth Build programs across our network. So we have 19 Youth Build programs that we are affiliated with or in partnership with, um, spanning from Fresno, California, all the way down to San Diego. Um, I am in my seventh year here with Youth Build Charter School of California. Um, and our school is actually in its 10th year serving the same population as youth build programs across the country and the world now. And we really just um, strive to really provide young people with an authentic education. And my work um, has moved from being in the classroom as a history and arts teacher and moving into site coordination with youth build programs. But primarily now a lot of my work is in providing trainings and support, not just to our teachers, but also our construction trainers on how to better support and instruct our young people in the field, as well as actually working with our young people on either presentation um, skills or public speaking skills, because we know that oftentimes our young people are our biggest teachers as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of my work moves beyond training and actually um, my title is Director of Student Engagement Services. And really we look at how do we become the most engaging school across the board um, so that young people who have usually been disadvantaged by the school process maybe haven't even attended a school sports event or a school field trip. How do we offer this to young people? Because we know that these are the kinds of things that get them excited about learning and about what their own story as learners. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do. And I got connected with the UDL work through my teacher fellows and it has really expanded the work that I do, not just um, in my work with uh, staff, but also with students. Just again, to make the UDL connection too, I mean, without knowing brain science, you're starting with engagement. It's, minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really wonderful, actually. It's been kind of a perfect fit. Thank you, okay. Michael. You're yes. sure. <laughs> uh, my name is Michael Anderson. Uh, I work with Youth Build Omaha. And I uh, kind of in charge of the education stuff here as far as that's concerned. I also do most of the cla all the classroom teaching pretty much. And um, basically, uh, our, I started out um, at, uh, well, I used to teach college and university stuff. Uh, most recently, I was at Brayton University here in Omaha for about eight and a half years. Uh, and I taught Latin American, Native American history and whatnot. And uh, how I got into this stuff Oh, well, I kind of was very dissatisfied with what I was doing. And well, I kind of got a tip to get into some uh, social work programs that were looking for people. They hired me because uh, I was really, uh, I don't really like these terminology, but outside the box kind of pick, uh, which is very different. And they found that those kind of people they felt were much more successful. And uh, all of a sudden there was a youth build through under kind of the same overseer. A uh, youth build um, teaching position opened up and they didn't have anyone to uh, have a man. So I was kind of ordered to take the job. <laughs> uh, that was about five years ago. And uh, I kind of came in and didn't know what to expect. I hadn't taught this kind of stuff before, or I mean, I've dealt with a demographic and things. I probably it would have been nice if youth builds were around when I was young, because I probably belonged in one, to be honest with you. Um, I think that uh, the biggest challenge, um, it was there wasn't any kind of program, uh, at least at mine, in, in place. Uh, and so I had to do a lot of learning on the fly and just do a lot of things by instinct, I think. Um, eventually, uh, I got involved with these guys uh, with the Teacher Fellowship, Teacher Fellows Program, and uh, where we were all introduced to the UDL and things like that uh, in an effort to try to kind of spread it around uh, the United States through Youth Builds, uh, basically because... Uh, it's something that can really help our program dealing with the demographic what we deal with. We don't, in, uh, at least in Nebraska, we have no uh, charter schools whatsoever. Um, for better or worse, they are legal in the state. And as such, uh, we are all based on the GED. Now, they don't give GEDs anymore. They give actual high school diplomas out. But you still have to pass the tests. And um, there are some programs, but not very many. It's really, really underdeveloped kind of a system. Um, and it changes all the time. And because of that, we're, uh, we decided to make ourselves be the one, one program that uh, 
nobody could do without. And so that's kind of been our overall goal as far as this is concerned. And uh, dealing with people that are, are out of high school um, are often not welcome back in with various barriers and things. Uh, it's often a challenge uh, to, to figure out. Uh, yet we try to engage with them as much as possible as to what, you know, the problem, why do you think you um, had issues in school? What, 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 what could have been done that would, help, would have helped you better? And oftentimes they don't really know. And so being exposed originally, like I said, to the UDL um, uh, gave me some things to try in class to try to uh, clear that up. And, um, and what I found was uh, a very, uh, well, rather extreme response, to be honest with you. Um, I've had a lot of success with it uh, originally because I came from the college ranks. Um, as Jason would tell you, I uh, poo-pooed the idea of teacher training to, to a large extent. Um, I was kind of an arrogant fool, like many people uh, can be. And I thought that, you know, the idea of knowing your field, intellectual rigor and whatnot was much more important than the manner in which one tries to get these ideas by or uh, the manner in which one engages or draws students in. And I was wrong. Uh, such is life. Uh, <laughs> a bit about that. Uh, with you guys. Um, the UDL uh, certainly was a good part of that. I mean, I took it very differently. I don't... Um, I don't involve myself in a ton of lesson planning or things like that. I still do it, but I don't do it probably in quite the structured manner, uh, which a lot of teachers who've been trained in that system, like second, post, you know, secondary and primary education and whatnot. Uh, but uh, I use it as an overall philosophy. And in that, I've had some very uh, remarkable striking. Um, I mean, we've had, I've had started a new cohort this October, and I already have uh, three high school diplomas in, you know, a few months, mm -hmm. but... Uh, are I'm usually about 90% on people raising their reading and math scores as far as the state's concerned, a certain number of grade levels and things like that, which we're responsible for. And um, before, I was always considered pretty successful at it. You know, I'm, I was bad at 50%, you know, 500, and it was great. Uh, I started doing this stuff, and I don't really have any direct uh, evidence, uh, except that all of a sudden my numbers started flying way, uh, way north. And as a result, uh, I got a lot of attention on me which is good and bad, I suppose. And, uh, but nevertheless, uh, yeah, uh, there, there seems to have been some very striking response to um, working with this. So did I forget anything in there? Or did I just ramble? Well, Allison, I can, I, one thing I forgot to kind of frame, and sorry participants for not mentioning this, but one of the, our, our uh, Youth Build USA in general, one of our interests in terms of uh, the, the work that we focus on in the fellowship with learning differences of universal design for learning, I think Isabel mentioned it is because, you know, our young people come to us having been pushed out of the school system many times and have experienced a lot of different uh, traumatizing events. Part of it could just be their educational experience. Part of it could be, you know, inter issues within their family. Uh, part of it could just be, you know, monitor marginalizing society could have been that they were in the uh, pr prison system for a little bit. So they come into our learning spaces having already questioning who they are, questioning if they should be there. Um, and when we got connected to the learning differences in UDL concept, um, as we try to look at equity and access for all our young people, as we try to, you know, help them to, to be able to have a critical analysis so they can go back in their communities and, and have some type of um, positive impact. We looked at the, the UDL concept, which is making this classroom space much more accessible. It's taking uh, emotion into play. It's taking charm into play. Um, it's, it's valuing the young people from where they're coming from and who they're trying to be. And valuing those experiences is one of those things where when we were presented with the UDL concept, we saw that it kind of it connected to what we're trying to do in terms of, uh, you know, equity and access and, 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 and liberation for our young people. You know, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate them as a means to liberation and use the educational pieces, the uh, post-secondary access, the GED, the diploma, the vocational trades, so that they can, you know, get those tools to be able to ultimately have that. But that's our ultimate goal. So um, I just wanted to frame that really quick. Well, and it's a real, that's actually, uh, Jason, a really nice lead in to the next question I have. And that's really thinking about what are some of those barriers that traditionally challenge your learners. So, Michael, I know you started to talk a little bit about um, just reflecting on what would have helped you um, do better in school. Oftentimes, teachers are ones who did well in school and think, you know, the system kind of worked and, and they are getting back in the system that, and, and often, you know, to, 
this is just how our brains work. We, our background informs what what we do and our perspective. And so, um, so what, so, so, so Jason, you're getting into um, some of those, what are some of those barriers that traditionally challenge your learners specifically? Because as you mentioned, it is a really unique population and, um, and it's a, it's a population that is, um, we can't lose. We yeah. absolutely can't learn, lose one of these individuals. So what are some of those barriers that you find they come to you with? Um, I think some of them, like, you know, it, or some of them are just based on, um, you know, a lot of our young people don't have a lot of grow up in families where they had a lot of access to generational wealth um, at all. So, you know, there's a fiscal issues that happen and that's just not with them it's just generations right so they're not coming in with that access to be able to get to certain places because of uh, fiscal means um that impacts a lot of different things right that impacts transportation that that impacts uh what district you're, you're in for schooling that you know impacts the resources that your schooling gets um and i think it also has impacts trauma you know a lot of young people grow up you know you know from there, there's a research showing that from eight years old you know, if you're a student that gets free or reduced price lunch and you're treated a certain way in school, that automatically you're starting to get those triggers for, you know, trauma and what that, that imprint on your brain. So I think, you know, money, transportation, um, I think a lot of times with the educators that they are, are with in their public schools while they're in them, it could be lack of cultural competence from the school administration and teachers. Um, and then I think for a barrier for the young people is when they internalize this in the way that it manifests themselves when they go into any educational space. And when I'm talking about education, I'm not just talking about the formal schooling piece, I'm talking about at work, because all of it you're learning, right? So it's all some type of education. So I think it has um, a lot of different, you know, the barrier could be just internally after a while. Another big one is childcare, lack of access to childcare. Um, and then even for, because we're talking about generational trauma as well, a lot of times their close family members or parents or guardians are not coming from having a satisfactory educational experience as well. So having an advocate in your advocate in your corner to be able to ask certain questions or demand that you have, uh, that you're treated a certain way in school. We have our young people coming in and that's on average that our young people are coming into our learning spaces. Isabella and Mike can speak to that uh, even more because they're dealing with the young people every day. But I would say those are some of the barriers that just on average that our young people are coming in with. And so having a concept or a framework like the UDL, which from the outset is looking to make it accessible for all learners, um, is a huge tool in the toolkit to be able to help our young people. Yeah, I think, um, thank you, Jason, for bringing up generational trauma. I think for me, when I think about the barriers, barriers for learners in our communities that are serviced by youth build programs are primarily young people of color from various communities that are have usually either been marginalized, disenfranchised, or have not received the resources that they um, should be allocated just to provide life, uh, you know, like access to livelihood and things that make quality of life available for many of these communities. So I think about, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles and much of what led me to become an educator was really being that student that was the fluke, you know, I was able to make it through when I saw the majority of my community and people who I knew were intelligent not following up and not being supported. And so I think about it, and one of the big things that comes out of this generational trauma is thinking about the language and the lack of access to really being able to advocate and even know um, how to speak up for yourself. And so I was raised by, you know, um, my grandmother did not speak the language when she came to the country and very much um, because of, you know, I, I do call it luck. I do believe that I ended up in college by sheer luck. My grandmother, you know, showed up to every school event, but did not and was not provided the tools and resources to even provide access for me. So much of what my work coming back into, um, you know, teaching was recognizing that part of um, my learning in college was this awareness of my historical lack of access mm -hmm. and really recognizing that I didn't think of myself as a learner, but much more as an object of what learning was happening. So right. you either follow the rules or you don't. And I think many of our young people come from communities that have been disenfranchised historically. If we look back into, you know, um, you know, what resonates from slavery, from colonization. I think oftentimes if we just look back at the um, establishments of schools in the United States, we can see that oftentimes 
these are not about creating lifelong learners. Schools were often thought of as production areas. And so I really think that for me, one of the big barriers that we removed for young people through UDL is that self-acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. I am a learner, but also mm -hmm. recognizing that the learning and knowledge that has come from our communities and families has also been either, you know, people have been told that what they or how they learned and how they were taught at home or in their own communities, because it's not a university or because there's no degree to follow up on it, that that learning is not valuable. So I think oftentimes the biggest barrier is removing this historical understanding that certain people deserve learning and deserve a certain quality of learning, whereas others do not. Yeah. And to think of the young age that they're carrying those burdens and internalizing those barriers and not having those advocates. It's just, it's, it's, it seems like a never ending spiral. Yeah. And I think honestly, one of the big things Thanks. that I uh, see as a barrier moving forward is really supporting, you know, the families and the communities, because we do know that our, 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 you know, students and our communities do have advocates, but how do we really empower people to, to remove their own barriers to really see themselves as active participants in that. And I think that that's a, a challenge, not just for us in the school um, forums, but really looking at our communities as a whole. How do we continue right. to look at um, the barriers just across the board as a society? Yeah, I think understanding that trauma is huge, as, as you mentioned. We know that for, uh, I could speak for myself being a, a Black American that in, in, you could say now and even in, in historically, learning for us and for slaves, like Isabella mentioned, our indigenous peoples, First Nation people was literally a radical act, like you were killed. If you were even thought to be doing it, our people who were teaching you or working with you were killed. So literally it's a radical act of resistance of living. So um, I think understanding that trauma and having that cultural competence, you know, working with marginalized populations is huge. Sorry, Mike, I know you're about to say something. No, it's okay. Uh, I was just going to make it a little more specific, so it was good that you went on with that. Um, I think that all of our students, ours the majority as well, are um, uh, students of color. Um, mm -hmm. There are a few exceptions, but not that many. Um, uh, and, but they all, all of our students come in with three barriers in common, which I don't think are traditionally described as barriers necessarily. Um, problem solving skills, for whatever reason, where they're coming from, are almost non-existent. Uh, critical thinking skills, uh, be it from school or wherever else, um, are very, very underdeveloped. And uh, their lack of success beforehand has often led to like self-esteem issues as well. And so these things are things that, uh, those three things are th uh, um, areas that we attack very directly, immediately before we even begin um, dealing with teaching them how to solve problems, um, using various methods, you know, and how to like look at your options and what can do instead of um, uh, responding just emotionally. Um, so there's certain level of detachment we try to get them involved with. Um, the whole course of even being here is about being in a positive environment and relationship building. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with, as they were saying, you know, getting um, understanding and being comfortable in one's identity. And at the same time, um, I think that uh, it, it's a process that they, are, that they all need. And um, it, it's one of the things that has helped them back. And so we try to help them, uh, you know, just through always being positive about things. Even if you have something to uh, engage them with uh, in a corrective manner, uh, we always have, I always try to at least have five or six positive things to say before I even address that issue whatsoever. Um, and critical thinking, I mean, obviously everything's about that. So I try to put them in shoes that sometimes make them very uncomfortable to put them in other people's shoes so that they um, have to try to think from a critical perspective. They may not realize they're doing it, but in the long haul, that's what they need to do to pass this test to get out of high school, for example, or to be successful at pretty much any level. And so we find that that's one of the things I think Youth Build does well is that we, at least my Youth Build, we do pretty well by um, uh, directly using that in every level of our program and whatever we do, be it the construction, woodworking, um, the education in the classroom, any of our leadership development, any of the different things of our program that we do, we try to be, we try to uh, deal with those three issues constantly, all the time, all the way across. So it's kind of like a, just part of the fabric of it rather than being something that we have to do. Does that make any sense? It does, and it, and it really, in, in thinking, you know, in, in learning, the more I learn about youth, 
build, the, the focus, as we mentioned earlier, on engagement and leadership, but also those real authentic life experiences that make the critical thinking, the development of self-esteem, the development of problem solving, that makes those relevant, I think um, seems to be something, a, a core piece to all of your programs um, that you really focus on. So to continue with some of um, what you're, so, so overwhelming barriers for sure, as you're talking and, you know, we, we could keep going on barriers, I, I have no doubt, but to think about, you know, the, the, how do we overcome some of these, um, not only internal barriers, but some of the overarching systemic barriers, um, and then some of the learning barriers that we're facing. Um, what are some of the strategies um, that, you, that you find are really helpful? And, and that I know we have a lot of general education um, uh, educators on, on the webinar today. Um, how could some of these perhaps translate um, and be used in programs even outside of Youth Build mm -hmm. um, to, really, to really start to better learning opportunities for all youth everywhere to, mm -hmm. you know, again, try to uh, continue that theme of, of universal and for all and, and focusing on the design of the learning environment as opposed to trying to um, problem solve the, the learner themselves. Um, what do you all mm -hmm. find um, have been really helpful in terms of taking steps towards all learners being able to fulfill those um, potentials? Uh, I can speak to two things really quickly. I think two things that I think of first and foremost are one, I think the educators need to do their work, right? Like, you know, we go into a classroom and we want to be able to truly share that learning space, which means you're sharing power, if you want to call it power. Um, and, and how are you able to do that with your students? Are you willing to do that with your students? So what does that mean for you? So I feel like educators need to do their work, understand who you're working with. And that's an always going to be a learning opportunity. It's not like you go and read this one book by you know, Paulo, Paulo Freire or, you know, Michelle Alexander, and you're good. No, you need to continually do that work on your own to understand not only the community, but understand your young people, interrogate the what it is that you believed coming into the classroom, what it is the why of what you're doing and the how you're doing it. So I think one, educators need to continue to always do their work, um, their internal work. And I think the other thing, kind of flipping what Mike was saying, uh, Mike was talking about a lot of times young people come in and they're lacking critical thinking skills. And I think he named a couple other things. And I do think that's true, but I also think part of it is also affirming that it may be that they have critical thinking skills, but they're not using it in the context of what you need in the class where when they're outside, I've seen a lot of people where it's even to, to be able to stay alive or to hustle to school or take care of family or figure out how to pay the light bill or do childcare or stay out of jail or evade the cops or you know just to live you have to be thinking critically, but you're not thinking that that's what it is, right? You don't have the name for it. So that's kind of like a more formal language that you use. So I think as educators to be able to affirm our young people and say that, you know, you were doing this in this space. I think that's huge for them to be able to name that and they know that, oh, I have, I have been using this skill up until this point. Now, how do you kind of transition that same skill to understand algebra for math? to learn a trade, to learn construction, to apply to jobs, to go to college and be able to talk the language with instructors or case, you know, it's, I think that that's a huge part of the affirmation. So yeah, we're educators are doing their work constantly and always evolving and being able to affirm young people's experience, their lived experience and the education, the informal education that they've had outside of the traditional classroom space um, are some of the things that I would name as, as trying to overcome barriers. With UDL, we often talk about you know, who's owning the learning when right. educator is the one holding the content, the curriculum, the materials, access mm -hmm. to different pieces. They're owning the learning. And when you start to open that up and put those pieces in the design of the learning environment, it becomes shared and it mm -hmm. becomes a process. And, and you know, the idea, uh, too, a lot of these skills are problem solving skills, critical thinking. You need a fully developed frontal lobe for that. Right. So. From 16 to 24, that's when that brain growth is, you know, on fire. And so it makes sense that those are skills that are going to pop up in some contexts and totally yeah. crash in others. And it's really giving them the language, the strength, um, and, and the means to be able to advocate for what they need based on their lived experiences, what they yeah. need to be able to move forward for their goals, um, which is very exciting. Um, Isabel, did you want to jump in there at all? Yeah, I think... It's interesting when you pose that question because I think, uh, you know, like pretty much when I was exposed to universal design for learning, you know, it was a great aha for the work that we do at YouthBuild, but 
uh, I came back and really thought like, oh, this is a, a life strategy. How do I look at life right. and working <laughs> with the parties and yeah. you know, just in general, how do I remove barriers is really mm -hmm. the question that continues to, um, you know, kind of be at the forefront of my mind whenever I'm working with anybody. And so I think one of the things that I would say is just even if you um, stick with that, I feel like it could make a big, a big difference in what you're able to provide educationally. If you just think about what are those barriers, because that question alone allows us to be dynamic. And that's what I think that we do well at Youth Build. We're mm -hmm. dynamic. We're aware of what the current context is, what are young people being exposed to and, and experiencing both good and bad so that we can leverage that and really make this something authentic. I think one of the big things that I took away in my initial trainings around with CAS and with UDL was if it's good for one, it's, uh, you know, it's good for all. And I think one of the big issues that I identified in myself as an educator is that oftentimes I thought, you know, the, the challenge to finding the answer was, you know, the, the learning portion. And what I realized is, for many of the young people that I was serving, that in itself was not learning. That in itself could be traumatic for some folks. If you are just being put through the ringer over and over again without ever being told you're right or you're onto something or you're getting close. And so I think it really changed um, how I approach teaching and learning, not just with students, but even with staff in thinking of if why make it harder when time is so limited, when we don't have enough time to teach or to share, when there's a lot of things pulling at our attention, how do we make things that's easily accessible and digestible? And I think that's really, you know, you're aware of what's going on around you. You're aware of what's going on with your learners. If you have that piece and you're aware of what gets in the way, then oftentimes we can really think about how do we make it an open avenue so everyone can get to the learning together. And I think those are, um, to think that learning is some sort of exclusive thing that only some people can achieve. Right. I think that was the barrier that I had to remove in myself through this uh, process because it helped me recognize, you know, in modern technology and everything that we do, why are we making it harder for our young people? Why are we still practicing um, strategies that were good in the 80s but have no place in 2018 or 2017? And so I would say that's a big one. And then I think one for me that I've noticed in applying this to um, the work that we do with the young people, one of the big ones that I have been um, trying to just feed people is what are those avenues? What are those option avenues? And I think about that because um, with UDL, you're looking at you know, the different forms of engagement, you're looking at the different ways something's represented, how you hear it, how you see it. So one of those things that I would just think about is how do you really just, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know how to put this into words. I think part of it is just how do you make as many avenues open and available so that like Jason said, you're not in control of the learning, but really empowering people to say, this is the kind of learning that works for me. Right. And as you said, this was the option, I'm going to take it. I think um, one of the big things that Jason brought up is very much about teaching the language, teaching people how to acknowledge themselves. And so the more we feed them, you know, the avenue, and this is why this worked for you, you know, you took this option because you like to um, express yourself through reading or through something written. I think all of those things is self-knowledge and the more that we provide people that self-awareness, I feel like they can find those avenues to their own learning after that. And I think with modern technology, you know, we are not limited to teaching in the classroom anymore. So how do we get them excited about just being learners? Mm -hmm. Then they're not compliant. They're actually advocating. And in terms of a life skill, we don't, we don't want learners who are just going to sit and be compliant and say, yes, this is what I'll do because you told me. We want them to actually disrupt what's going on a little bit and innovate and push. So those, um, those, those traits that may have been seen as negative are really positive and are really necessary and, and shouldn't be, um, yeah, should, should, be, should be seen as, I like how you talk about them as open avenues uh, as opposed to roadblocks. Mm. And one thing I would say, especially for all of those um, who are listening, who are classroom teachers that say, hey, I can't just leave open-ended options for everything. I believe having no options is the option. And what I mean by that is 
I, if I have to teach a five paragraph essay because this is what's going to get you to the next level in college or your career, then by making it clear to young people what the purpose of what they're working on is, I think that that is the option. They get to buy in to the purpose or not. They get to choose this is valuable or not. And so I would say for those of you who are in the classroom that say, hey, but I have to still get them to pass this unit or these equations, keep that in mind. The more that we have if we remove the barrier of why it's being learned, if we clarify the purpose, then they get to choose whether they want to keep that in their minds or not. So this brings me to the next question because I have to say it has been overwhelming how from the very beginning of the conversation I've heard, start with the positive, start with values, get to know the strengths. Um, so I, I'm blo you often don't hear that when you, when, um, when you hear <laughs> uh, conversations, you know, often I, I'm thinking of, of IEP conversations, for example, that start with what learners can't do. So mm -hmm. um, you all have just been um, sending out positive vibes and positive approaches. So um, what do you think educators in the field should know in order to really help create these positive learning environments for all learners? Um, again, I've, I've been overwhelmed with how you've subtly um, uh, been really talking about supporting awareness and making uh, making um, authentic connections. Um, what else? Yeah. What other pieces do you think are really key um, for all? Again, thinking about all educators to really create these environments. Michael, do you want to start? Yeah, I, I think from my perspective, just since I'm doing this now, I think. Um, Part of it's on the administrators and educators, but I often find that even my students on themselves are they have such high expectations of where they're supposed to be in such a short period of time. They, it's not just unrealistic, but I mean, you know, the system or whatever it is has led them to believe like you need to be here and if you're not there, then you're no good. And, um, and they literally believe this, you know, I mean, it's, it, yeah, I, when I was their age, I did too. And I think that, uh, one of the things that I use at least and I, I think is, is, is good in a good way is um, the idea of just the small steps they make. They're making small positive steps every day. And I point out those steps every day along the way, no matter what, if it takes just a little comment here, or tap on the shoulder there, anything I can do to show them, look, man, look what you did. I had a student today, um, he took a practice test for the GED to see if he can go take the real thing. And um, he came up a few points short, which is devastated. I'm like, man, you look how far you've come in this short period of time. Look at this and this. This means you only missed it by one question. And once you rephrase it, that kind of terminology and show him what he's accomplished rather than what he didn't make and what he didn't do, um, his, his whole attitude changed. And he went out positive and ready to take another one tomorrow. And you're like, oh, okay. Well, that's, you know, so I, I think that that's always been part of my approach. I had a real problem with educators. Uh, when I age, um, and any kind of authority <laughs> figure whatsoever. So uh, I've, I've always been uh, big on, you know, if I don't have an explanation for it or a reason, I always have given reasons why I do things. We're doing this in class because this is what I'd like to get from it. Do you have any suggestions? What else can we do to get there? What, do you, what would you like to do in, in addition to this or instead of it, you know, and asking their part of it? Because if I don't have an answer to one of those questions, then I need to figure out and do something else. And so I kind of, um, that's kind of my approach with it, with the small steps and taking their feedback and taking it very seriously and trying to incorporate it into what we're doing. It requires a lot of doing things on the fly a lot of times, but hey, it, it, it works. And so uh, it makes them much more engaged in the process in my experience. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I wanna acknowledge Michael. And just so everyone knows, we have worked together before. I know a little <laughs> bit about his classroom, but one of the things that I do um, think is important about that positive learning environment is Michael exemplifies what it is to be a responsive educator and so being able to be on the fly I think one of those things is um, has been really difficult for a lot of people but I think one of the one of the beauties that I've seen from Michael is being so recognizant that the student experience in that moment and that mm -hmm. learning trumps whatever goal Right. was that lesson you know you follow the passion so i you could speak on that more mike i just wanted to toot your horn a little bit thank you but now i'm, I'm i think i got my message across yeah right <laughs> i can talk all day we don't want to we don't want to get that started <laughs> i i think uh and, and so not to be quite allison but when i look at this question i kind of 
you know, change their word. I, you know, so for me, I'm thinking, I don't know if it's, well, they need to know stuff, right? But I actually, for me, I, I want to know what they care about. Because I think what you care about will impact your goals and who do you think you need to be. Like, what, what, what does that mean for you in type of the work you need to do as an educator, whether you're an administrator, uh, support staff, um, vocational trainer, traditional classroom teacher. Um, and, and so I come to this kind of really briefly when I've studied just like historical movements throughout, uh, you know, history. If we're looking at civil rights movement with like the armed resistance movement or the Mississippi Freedom Schools, what I found um, is that you know, even when slaves were teaching themselves to uh, teaching themselves to read back in the 1860s, and it's one of the resources I provided on here, uh, it wasn't just they were reading a book because they thought reading was fun. It was because they were trying to liberate themselves, right? You know, and they knew what that would take. They needed literacy. Um, they needed agency. They needed to be able to know how to vote. So, you know, when we talk, think about reconstruction and thinking about how all of a sudden in this small period, all of a sudden all these uh, black Americans were taking these like uh, offices as senator and what have you. And it's, it, it's because there was a history of they were teaching themselves and literally starting, um, literally starting schools all across the country, which is now why we have free schooling, right? It's, it started because of the slaves. And so when I think about that, I'm thinking they had a goal in mind. They were, it was education as a means for liberation for them, but they needed all those core skills, right? They needed to know how to, the literacy, they needed like the math, they needed to understand the world around them and how it came together, the interconnectedness of all of that to help them get where they need to be. So I think it's really about what you care about. And I think that is uh, that really informs, it, it informs like how you, you are choosing to move in the classroom. And I do agree with, with Mike was mentioning um, for the young people too, like also being able to provide them with a sense of agency um, in the classroom. Uh, so that they feel like they're, uh, Isabel mentioned this too, so they feel like they're opting in and they know the why. Like, we're getting this education on this piece of content as a means to what? Post-secondary access is great. Uh, uh, a living wage is great. But as a means to what exactly? And I think about this because I think if you're working in lives with the pop working with the population that we work with, I know it's, it's not just enough for you to be able to get to college because you have so many forces systemically that are working against you. You can go to college but you also can be arrested in college. You can be harassed in college. There's a whole lot of things that happen if you're not able to have the skills to critically analyze the system that you're in. Um, so yeah, it, you know, it's kind of like a convoluted answer, but I do think it's really what educators and what do you care about, which can inform what type of environment you're setting up for your young people. Youth Build is really unique as well in the connections that you work to make with those communities. So you can start to see some of the impact of, of the skills that they're build, building in their own backyards. Right. And that's something that can often be missing um, in, our, in some of the traditional settings. I'm gonna jump ahead a couple of slides because we have, um, CAST is working in partnership with Youth Build also on a research project. And so if I could pause our conversation for just a moment and introduce Sam Johnston who is a research scientist here at CAST. Um, and we're just gonna share just a moment of um, some of the work that's happening with the career explorations and readiness environment for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, a research project going on with cast and youth build so here's sam hi hey so sam jason, jason's working um very closely with us on this work um as well as um uh umass amherst um and i've just caught kind of the tail end of the conversation but i think it's one of the things we found as we're you know this is a four-year project we're really collaboratively um, designing now um, with Youth Build and with uh, UMass Amherst, we're in seven youth sites across five states um, where we're really going from kind of talking about what is ex career exploration and engagement in STEM, what are STEM competencies, how do we make these make sense on the ground in the real world, how do we make these connect to values um, and, you know, the work that gets done around um, trying to ensure that communities are um, what we want them to be. And, um, you know, thinking about things about who gets access to building evidence in science, who gets access to um, making decisions about what should be studied, for example. And that's where, you know, what Jason was just saying about, you know, not education for its, just its own sake, but education to be a critical actor in the world that has influence, that influences what we study what um, 
hypotheses get made. You know, I used to work with a, a psychiatrist who used to always say, these are just hypotheses. Science is just a hypothesis, you know, and, and I think um, when we look at this work around getting um, young people in youth bill to um, work with us to think about what would be helpful tools and supports and resources to, to help with their already good work that's being done around exploring um, engagement in science, technology, engineering, and math, and linking to possible careers that are both specific STEM careers, but also careers that use STEM. Um, this, this work of, of thinking about, you know, being in these careers is helpful because they're, you know, good middle to high income jobs and they're, um, you know, they're growth areas, but they're also critical because it helps us shape the future of scientific research. It helps us, you know, shape the future of, of what kind of sustainable buildings we want, you know. Are we going to do, make decisions to build affordable housing in communities or not? Well, we need people who have who are in leadership positions, like, you know, who are engineers, who are, you know, leaders in the building trades, who are leaders in, in various areas to help us make those types of decisions. So I think that's one of the big things we've learned is it's not just about building kind of hard skills, like can you, you know, engage in mathematical reasoning or do you understand how chemistry is applied to work, but do you understand the, the values um, behind these decisions. And so we're trying to do a range of things. We're building um, an e-portfolio where young people can kind of document and reflect on and have the, 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 the um, youth build staff that are working with them also evaluate um, what STEM competencies they're building. Um, we're having kind of using multimedia to build some cases with people who have STEM careers or careers where they use STEM that are compelling, you know, that have both sort of, have made compelling decisions in terms of the choices they've made and what to study, um, if they're scientists, but also, you know, compelling in terms of, you know, their journeys of interesting and the skills they have or parent. Um, and then obviously in terms of UDL, building um, scaffolds and supports throughout so that we're not, you know, creating barriers to STEM career exploration and engagement or building STEM competencies by saying, you know, you need to go and understand this really um, convoluted explanation of what it is to, you know, think about equip equipment safety. But actually, let's look at that tangibly on the ground so we're not creating a barrier and having someone who actually might have lots of skills in that area not even be aware that they have them because we put it in a, a medium or a format that's, that's inaccessible for them even understanding the skills they have. So... Just a chance to tell you a few words about the project, but you know, people are interested can follow up and we can share more. I don't know if Jason wants to say anything about it um, as well. Um, I no, that's you it. Had it. I yeah. you got it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we again, this is really just the beginning of the conversation. Um, and um, so just, just to, to wrap up a little bit, if learning had no limits, pie in the sky. Um, where do you where do you want education to go? How can how can we positively impact our society here? You've got thirty seconds. Just <laughs> thirty seconds to save the world. Go ahead, Mike. Equal access. Equal access. How how can we get there? Do you have one one concrete um, suggestion for how? Admitting that we don't have it now would be a start. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we, we could just stop there. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's good. Um, I mean, removing student debt would be another one or making university and college free for all and making enough colleges to house all of the graduates. I think that yeah. would be brilliant. Is there an action item we can take for that? <laughs> I would say advocating for more community colleges and universities in your states. I think the reality is if young people are fighting for seats in community college, then really what are we, um, what are we preparing them for after high school? And so I think um, particularly in California, it's been very noticeable, but you know, how can that, it's a barrier that we don't even talk about where and young people say, oh, I have to fight for a seat in a class. I think that's automatic uh, barrier to education. So yeah, action item, just advocate, get political. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think I agree with everything Mike and Isabel said. I think kind of dial it back. I'd want to rethink the whole system. Not rethink. I'd want to change it. Here, here's why it's, I want it to be. I, I can't tell you how it all would work, but I know what I'd want it to be based on. I feel like based on some core values of equity for all. So we're talking about uh, LGBTQ students. We're talking about women and, and stopping this toxic masculinity and patriarchy. We're talking about a, a equitable uh, economic system. We're talking about sustainability for communities. We're talking about love. So if we can even I'd say, you know, UDL is based on the goals and how we get there, right? So can we kind of, can we rethink and reevaluate and then change what we're basing everything on? Because I think, you know, as I, again, looking at historical context, education was based on who do we want to be and, and how do we get there? So if we're saying that this is who we want to be as like stewards of this earth. And I don't think this is being existential, like who do we want to be and how does that inform, like, how do we learn? How do we get there economically creating communities? How do we care for each other, the disabled, the elderly, um, you know, children? Right now in the U.S., if you look at our stats for like how, you know, rates of like infants and how we, uh, you know, afford our, a child care, how do we fund it, especially in marginalized communities? Like you can kind of look on paper and see like what we don't care about. So maybe flipping that and say, okay, this is what we care about and this is how we're going to get there. I think starting there, I would love it. We can bring those core values into each and every one of our classrooms, right. in whatever context you all are in. So this can be a little call to action to think about right. identifying what those, what those core values are and then start basing decisions on those. I know we had a couple of um, resource recommendations. It's always fun to know, you know what you're reading or, or um, what, are, what, you know, what are some resources that you, you have just found to be very valuable. Jason, you want to talk about these briefly? Uh, yes, this, these are not necessarily UDL related. I'd say just in the last year, uh, all three of his books, I think has had an impact on me. Uh, really quick, Carter G. Woodson in his book, Miseducation of the Negro. It's really a, an interesting book in talking about questioning the, the education as a means for what? So for specifically for the black community. So, you know, you have somebody studying the STEM and they go and get an engineering degree. How do they take, they take those skills and contribute the community? So it's not education, not just education to earn, but education to help liberate the community. Audre Lorde, I think, is great because it's a compilation of essays and it really speaks to the courage it takes to be in the classroom and working with young people. But also, I think, as, we, as I talked about dismantling patriarchy and toxic masculinity, like upholding and liberating and listening to women, specifically in this case, I'd say uh, Black women, Black feminists, and what all that means. And so kind of like the intersection of that and education, I think it's rich because we have all of these young people coming into the classroom. And the last one I'd referenced earlier, Education of uh, Blacks in the South by James D. Anderson is just a really illuminating book talking about um, slave from 1860 to, to 1935, how uh, the, uh, slaves, while they were in slaves, were teaching themselves and starting educational schools, principals, superintendents, and how that informed the public system, the free public uh, education system that we have now. So. Um, and maybe people look at that and, they, you know, I think if you look at it, maybe you connect it to UDL. I can see the connection because it's UDL is access for all and, and having a concrete goal and options. So um, those are just a few that have been meaningful to me for me in the last year. That's fabulous. Thank you. Um, and um, and so if you have any questions or comments, we invite you to. I know that we've, <laughs> we're ready to change the system here in this short one hour conversation. So um, if you have any concrete um, ideas, resources, questions that you want for our panelists as you're um, typing those in, I'm just going to mention very briefly, um, CAS UDL Summer Symposium um, had hold the dates. Um, it, uh, the theme is going to be Empower Learners. And it will be July 30th through August 1st um, up here in Cambridge, Massachusetts at Harvard Law School. Our call for for proposals will be coming shortly. Um, there's an expanding list of titles from CAST uh, Professional Publishing. You heard a little bit from CAST Research. Um, thank you again, Sam, for stopping in. Um, there's more of that off of the CAST website. Um, and also coming soon, the UDL guidelines are going to be updated on CAST website. There's, um, it's the same content, just a new representation that really focuses much more on the goal of expert learning. Learning, um, because we really want to make sure that we are thinking about how we are developing learners who are lifelong expert learners and that again to tie to 
some of the points that were made um, in, earlier in the conversation. When we're thinking about education, how are we really developing um, this expertise and advocacy within our, our learners? Um, I found this quote from a YouthBuild graduate. At a moment in my life when nothing was going right, I found YouthBuild and began a journey that has brought me to the place I am now. Wouldn't it be amazing if each of our um, education contexts could provide this for even just one individual, um, maybe more. So, um, so I want to leave you all with that thought. Um, Jason, Isabel, Michael, uh, do you have any final thoughts for us as, um, as we sit you out into the sunny day? <laughs> Um, I don't want to take, I think Jason's message was perfect, but one thing that I will say is one of the big things that Jason talked about was like our humanity and really caring about people as, as one another. So I just want to recommend, I think a good next step and one thing that we're working on at our school to build on from UDL is working on trauma-informed practices mm -hmm. and really becoming aware on what that does to the brain. Um, because CAS and UDL really is founded on brain science. I think one of the big things that we need to remember is how we are all impacted by trauma in some way or another and how that impacts our learning. And so I think uh, that would be a good recommendation. And yes, join us in this movement to create equitable, um, loving, caring, genuine, I don't know, I'd say vote Jason Marshall for president because no, no, you don't he, was want able, that. he was able to put it realistically. <laughs> Um, but that would be one thing I would say. And thank you so much. Yeah, Fabulous. Thanks. Okay, and maybe this will be our next conversation with you all. We can we have a dot 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 to be continued. <laughs> uh, so please feel free to um, yes, we do have a quick survey um, to get feedback from today's webinar or ideas you have for upcoming ones. But thank you all so much for being here today. It means so much to me and to the field. Thank you for the hard work that you do every day. Um, and let's keep the conversation going. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, everybody. Good to see you, James Etta. <laughs> we'll stay on for another you know, minute or so. If you all do have questions, we can, as you all are, are um, logging off, let us know and we can address them. All right. Well, thank you all so much. <laughs> awesome, you guys. Thank you. We'll be in touch offline. <laughs> all right. Take care. Bye. Have a great day. Bye, guys. All right. See you guys later. <laughs>